Let me hit the record button, share screen. I'm getting nervous. Here we go, full screen, and it moves forward. Great, so it seems to be working now. So thanks, Ryan, for helping out uh, over the, the la uh, course of last week. So hopefully uh, I don't need to rely on you uh, since this point. So apparently crashing Zoom uh, when sharing screen has been a known bug. And I had to uh, uncheck the hardware acceleration for video. And so that was the trick. It seems to be working so far. So we will see how that goes. All right. So. Professor, you accidentally muted yourself. So you couldn't hear me? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so anyway, so we uh, uh, hope that the Zoom doesn't crash anymore because I at least uh, try to accommodate the known bug in Zoom by unchecking the hardware acceleration for video. And so it uh, seems to be working so far. So we'll see if that actually holds up. So we started to talk about the harmonic oscillator for several reasons. One of them is that we just want to review quantum mechanics, starting from the Lagrangian, going to Hamiltonian, setting up quantum computation relation. So that's one thing. And second reason is that we do use creation addition operators in quantum field theory. So it's good to actually uh, become familiar with that once again, even though you have seen it in quantum mechanics class. And, and you'll see also other reasons that will come up later when we talk about the classical limit of the harmonic oscillator. So anyway, so you have seen this slide uh, last week. So there's this famous algebraic method by Dirac to solve the harmonic oscillator problem. So you basically rewrite harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, basically P squared plus X squared as a square, uh, the absolute square of a complex numbers. But when you actually pay uh, close attention to the ordering between X and P operators, then writing it this way actually gives you this extra zero point energy term half H bar omega. And the creation iteration operators are precisely those things in these parentheses when you take, make this into an absolute square. So A is an addition operator or a lowering operator. Uh, roughly speaking, that's X plus IP. And creation operator is a Hermitian conjugate. Roughly speaking, that's X plus, minus IP. And Hamiltonian is written in this simple form. H bar omega factors out. And you have this A dagger A plus one half. And you can immediately check from the canonical commutation relation between X and P that A and A dagger commutator is given by one. So, so these are the basic, <clears throat> basic things about a harmonic oscillator. And stop me anytime if you have any questions. And knowing that this is the form of the grounds at the, harmonic, at the Hamiltonian, you can immediately conclude that the minimum energy, namely the ground state, is obtained by the condition that it is annihilated by this annihilation operator. So the, the argument is that when you actually look at the expectation value of the Hamiltonian operator, then this is just sandwiched between the two identical states psi on both sides. And now I rewrite Hamiltonian using this form written in terms of creation addition operators. So the first term is this, second term is just a number now. And the first term is actually the norm of this ket a acting on the state psi. Because if I take uh, the complex conjugate of this, I take the complex conjugate of ket, that becomes the bra psi, and complex conjugate of A turns into A dagger, Hermitian conjugate. So that's how we know that this combination is really the norm of this state. And norm of any state is positive semi-definite. So the minimum it can be is zero, can never be negative. So this is, uh, 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 the larger than or equal to half h bar omega. So the minimum is achieved only when this state by itself vanishes. So that's how we know the ground state satisfies this condition that it is annihilated by the annihilation operator A. So what that means is that looking at the, the definition of annihilation operator, which is written in terms of X and P, then the ground state wave function has to be annihilated by this differential operator, the only change from this operator A to this differential operator is change P in terms of H bar over I dDx. That's the position representation of the momentum operator. 
And I hope you have seen that in, in 137. Then what it gives me then is this first order differential equation in X. And typically showing the equation is second order differential equation, but this is first order, so it's a lot easier to solve. And then you can even check with your eyes that this Gaussian form satisfies this differential equation because ddx pulls out minus m omega 2x over 2h bar from the exponent. That precisely cancels this first term m omega over h bar times x. So the Gaussian is a solution to this differential equation. And therefore, up to an overall normalization, this is a correct wave function for the ground state of harmonic oscillator. So by using this algebraic method, which was kind of abstract, you can make everything much more concrete because now you know the wave from the ground state. And all you have to do to get all the excited states is keep acting a dagger on top of this ground state wave function. And in quantum mechanics class, you probably have seen these expert solutions using the special functions called Hermit polynomials. But in some sense, you don't need to know that. You just need to act a dagger on this Gaussian function uh, as many times as you need. And that's how you can construct the excited state wave functions uh, 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 using this uh, raising operator or creation operator. And for the normalization of the ground state, this normalization factor script n, uh, you can easily find out just by knowing how the Gaussian integral works. And I hope you can find that out in, in, in any textbooks if you like, so, so that you can fix this n uh, without doing any sort of uh, uh, complicated calculations on your own. So now you know everything about the ground state wave function. And excited states can be built by acting the, uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, on that last slide, um, on the oh. third from the bottom, why did you take the inner product of X and the zero state? So X and zero state is the wave function. So the X is the position representation of the ground state zero, which is nothing but this psi naught X. That's the ground state wave function. So this is uh, uh, this bracket notation that when you have a state expressed in ket, its wave function in position space is given by the inner product of that ket vector with this position bra. So this position bra is an eigenstate of the position operator. And this inner product has the meaning of the probability amplitude of the ground state zero being in a position eigenstate X. That's nothing but this probability uh, a wave of psi naught of X, which is nothing but the wave function. Does that answer your question? Uh, what does this ket zero like represent? Ket zero represents the uh, the ground state uh, of the harmonic like, oscillator. I'm sorry. It's a function of like. Is it a function of x or? No, it's not a function of x. It's an abstract uh, vector in the Hilbert space of the quantum mechanics. And only after taking this inner product to a position bra, it becomes a function of x. Okay, I see. Thank you. Uh, did, 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 did that make sense? I just would like to be sure. Yes, it makes sense. Thanks. Okay, good, good, all right. Okay, so then moving on to the next slide. Now that we know everything about the ground state, we can talk about excited states. And we define this operator for the number operator, which is A dagger A. So the Hamiltonian is nothing but N plus one half times H bar omega. And knowing this commutation relation between A and A dagger, you can easily work out the commutation relation between N number operator and A annihilation operator right away. So N is A dagger A. A of course commutes with the other A here, but A dagger doesn't commute with A. So that's the only piece I need to compute. I factor this A out of the commutator. And A dagger A is the negative of A A dagger commutator just different ordering. So this becomes minus one times A is minus A. So that's how I know this NA commutation relation. In a similar way, I can work out NA dagger commutation relation. In this case, what doesn't commute is A part of N. So I factor this A dagger out. A A dagger is one. So this is one times A dagger. So I get plus A dagger. So knowing these uh, commutation relations, 
you can actually build the entire Hilbert space of the harmonic oscillator. So if you have already an eigenstate of this number of operator n with an eigenvalue of little n, I can act this the lowering operator or annihilation operator on this n state, then figure out how many, how much, uh, what is the eigenvalue of this number operator of this state after acting this uh, lowering operator. So then I take off this parentheses because everything is associative. Then Na can be written as Na commutative plus An, Na minus An plus An. So I haven't changed anything. The whole thing is still Na. But Na commutator, I just worked out to be minus A. An, now this N operator is acting on the state N, so pulls out the eigenvalue little n. And putting that together, I find the eigenvalue N minus one. So this is the way we see that the annihilation operator is really a lowering operator. So starting from the state n with the eigenvalue little n, acting a would turn this eigenvalue one step lower to n minus one. So that's how we know a is the lowering operator. And if you do the same thing for a dagger on this left, then you find that it is in the, the raising operator. So the eigenvalue of the number operator changes from little n to little n plus one. You can also work out the normalization of this state. So if you take the norm of this a n state, I can take the countless conjugate of this state, n ket turns into n bra, a turns into a dagger, but we know a dagger a is the number operator, which is by definition is, is, has an eigenvalue little n on this state. So a dagger a turns into number little n and the rest is one by the normalization. So this is just n. So what that means is that if you act lowering operator on state n, I'm supposed to get state n minus one because I got that eigenvalue. But because the norm of the state is n, I have to factor out square root of n to make sure that this n minus one state is correctly normalized. And I do the same thing also for the, the, uh, the raising operator. If I have a dagger n here, taking complex conjugate, I get n a a dagger n. And a a dagger can be written as a dagger n together with this commutator. So this thing inside a a dagger is capital N plus one. Capital N turns eigenvalue little n. So that, now I get this little n plus one. So that means that a dagger n state is also not correctly normalized, but by factoring out the square root of the norm I just computed, square root of n plus one, I do get the correctly normalized state with eigenvalue n plus one of the number operator capital N. So now I know how you can go up and down the ladder. Uh, and so then I put the, you know, the, the information on the ground state and apply this technique of going up and down, and then I can construct the entire Hilbert space. And that's the way Dirac constructed the Hilbert space for harmonic oscillator. Are there any questions about this? I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, so you said we can construct the entire Hilbert space, but does that mean Hilbert space is infinite dimension? Yes, Hilbert space in any quantum mechanics system is typically infinite dimensional. And in order to have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, you need to have a rather peculiar system. Uh, so they, they roughly speaking, in, in any classical mechanics, there you have a phase space, namely that you specify initial conditions of uh, possession and initial velocity, or equivalently initial momentum. And X and P can take any values you like. So the space you start out with, given in terms of the initial X and P is infinite. Mm -hmm. And this, this space uh, volume of X and P uh, has a dimension of H bar. So by going to, uh, from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, roughly speaking, you divide up the space of X and P in cells of the size two pi H bar to count the number of possible states in your quantum system. So if you start out with infinite range for X and P, and then you should divide that into cells of the volume two pi H bar, you still get infinite number of cells. That means infinite number of states. So only when you go to some real, real system where X is confined in a finite box 
and so is P confined in a finite box. That's very unusual because normally if you put particle in a finite box, momentum can still take arbitrary value all the way up to infinity. But only when you have such a weird system where both X and P are limited, then its quantum version can have finite dimension, Hilbert space. But I have to say that's actually an exception rather than the norm. So normally Hilbert space of any quantum mechanical system is infinite. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes. good. Um, I yeah. want to follow yeah. that. Okay, great. Um, so can we can we calculate um, a certain region of your space, uh, the quantum, uh, the number of quantum states of that subspace? Can we use the same technique as you used? Uh, just uh, answering her question. Uh, in many By cases, yes. The right. volume. Right. Okay. In many cases, yes. And indeed, I'm going to have that discussion later on when I talk about classical limit of harmonic oscillator and a special state called the coherent state. And hopefully I get there uh, actually today. Uh, if not, that will come up on Friday. So you see how the space of two pi h bar would really show up in the classical phase space. So please wait till then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at this stage? Um, All right. Uh, oh, go ahead. The question is, um, from last le lecture to this lecture, we also, we have mentioned that um, the scale of H bar. So apparently from classical to um, quantum um, point of view, we both uh, use the, mainly change the, the unit sets that we do the physics, which um, emerges H bar. But, um, mm -hmm. I learned in uh, statistical mechanics before that we can also do a partition, as you said, that we can have two pi h bar. So is this the only formulation to divide up the Hilbert space using uh, this, uh, only this kind of formulation? Or um, is there a reason why there is only one or is there multiple? I'm not sure I got the question correctly. So, so you said X can also be divided up in H bar? Um, no, but, um, because in, in classical mechanics, we, okay. we have Poisson brackets. Mm -hmm. And in classical mechanics, um, the Poisson bracket of X and P commute. Commute means, wait, um, yes. X and P commute in classical mechanics, but in yep. quantum mechanics, X and P does not commute. Right. So basically it's because of the classical limit, which, mm -hmm. um, but the problem is um, if we look at the states in, um, in space, <clears throat> we can actually plot X, P as an axis because they are, they, they do not commute. And I, the thing is, that bugs me the most is, is I don't understand like why, since when, um, when why do we realize that um, it does not commute because it is all so-called mechanics and I don't understand what sets apart the difference. Well, let's see. So the classical mechanics doesn't know quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics knows classical mechanics as a limit of sending H bar to zero. So you can, in principle, never recover quantum mechanics from classical mechanics where X and P commute. There's no way to promote that to operators. But from quantum mechanics, XP has this canonical commutation relation and you can set H bar to zero so that X and P would commute in that limit. So you can go from quantum to classical, but classical mechanics doesn't know quantum mechanics. But for some reason, classical mechanics had been formulated using Lagrangian Hamiltonian and Poisson bracket that looks awfully similar to what we need in quantum mechanics at the end of the day. So that's why we were lucky enough to jump from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. And I don't know why human beings are so smart to get ready for that jump, uh, but it's just a similarity. So uh, taking H bar going to zero limit is something you can do any of us can do. Going from classical to quantum is only the geniuses could do. And, and uh, that's why we, we can sort of take benefits of all these uh, uh, the giants uh, that came before us. So uh, I, I don't know, I'm answering, answering question. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank okay. You. All right. So, uh, if you have any further questions, don't hesitate to ask. All right. So uh, now we know how to build excited states using the correct norm. And so knowing that, for example, a dagger acting on the ground state zero gives you square root of zero plus one, which is one. So going from the ground state, the first excited state, there's no change in normalization factor. So that's the one response I've given on Piazza when somebody was asking a question about the uh, Gaussian integral. So once you have properly normalized the ground state already, then acting a dagger would give you the properly normalized the uh, first excited state wave function. So it turns out that you don't need to worry about it. So putting everything together, uh, we have obtained this relationship acting a dagger will turn it the n state to n plus one state with this normalization factor of square root n plus one. And you can keep doing this all the way starting from the ground state where the eigenvalue of the number of operator is zero. So it turns out that here, I just mentioned that the change in normalization factor is square root of one, which is one. So I, you don't need to do anything. You're just acting a dagger on the ground state wave function, which is Gaussian, gives you the correct wave function uh, of the first excited state with the correct normalization. But if you keep going up to higher excited states, you have to pay attention to these factors of the square root of n as you go on. So that's the way you can build this entire Hilbert space, which is infinite dimensional, as we just talked about, starting from the ground state and keep acting the creation operator on top of it. So what that tells you is that by putting all these factors together, going from the ground state zero all the way up to this excited state, state n, I need to multiply all these normalization factors from square root one, two, three, four to square root n, that actually multiplies together to n factorial inside the square root. So that's very convenient. So acting a dagger n times on the ground state will give you the nth excited state times the factor of the square root of n factorial. So that's something we learn right away from this way of formulating the problem. So that then tells us that n excited state can be written algebraically in this form, acting a dagger n times on the ground state, and then divided by this over normalization factor of square root of n factorial. We also learned that going down, uh, in steps always gives you this factor of square root n on the previous slide. So if you do a on this, I get factor of square root n, square root n minus one and so forth. And eventually you go all the way down to the ground state. And once you come to ground state, acting a once more would give me zero minus one. So minus one state, which we didn't think that should exist but there's a factor of a square root of zero. So it turns out that acting A on the ground state gives you zero. So that's why you can't go any further and this whole sequence stops. And that's completely consistent with the argument we made that if you solve for the ground state, then the ground state should be annihilated by the annihilation operator A and you indeed precisely find that in retrospect. So the ground state acting A on it would read you at square root of zero and hence there's no way to go below this point. So the Hilbert space really does start with this ground state zero we talked about already. So then you know, this is it. So that's how we know the entire Hilbert space of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, let me stop here again to see if there are any questions. Um, was this, um... Annihilation and um, creation operators were these uh -huh. created with these definition so that if you apply the annihilation operator on the ground state, it will it'll return zero? Or was mm -hmm. it the oh, that is this is the definition, or is this the result of like the, um, the construction from other ideas? So, so we got that condition right here, right? And that was from the requirement that you want to minimize the Hamiltonian expectation value. And we knew Hamiltonian expectation value at the zero point energy piece plus something positive semi-definite. 
So in order to get the lowest, then this semi-positive definite P should be zero. So that was the condition on the ground state. But we wanted to be sure that this condition on the ground state is consistent with what these creation annihilation operators do in terms of going up and down in steps. So that's why we worked out these normalization factors carefully, uh, how A and A dagger act on these number states. And then we eventually found this ladder diagram of how you can go up and down this ladder. And then by looking at the any excited states you like in this case, then you can keep lowering the state and eventually you hit zero. And that's where acting A on zero precisely give you completely zero in the end. So you can't go any further. So that's how everything turns out to be consistent. So that's what we want to check on this slide. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions? Um, hi, Professor. Um, Call me Hitoshi. Uh, uh, okay. Hi. Um, so my question is that these um, square root and stuff um, looks really familiar to me. Like I, I think I've thought with something like this when huh? I'm doing um, statistical mechanics, and oh, okay. where we have Einstein. Um, but both Einstein statistics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that um, is these prefactors emerges because like we're using commentators who is real gives rise to bosonic particles. I just want yeah, to that's know, right. Is there so it turns out that what we end up doing is to use this creation annihilation operators to literally create a boson or annihilate a boson. So right now we are dealing with quantum mechanics. So all a and A dagger do is go up and down in the energy spectrum of a single particle. Here, you are never creating a particle or adding a particle. You have one particle in harmonic oscillator, and you are only going up and down in energies. But what we end up doing in quantum field theory is literally use this annihilation operator as a way of annihilating a particle from the system. So if you have a system with many bosons, you literally remove one particle out of the system. And if you act a dagger on the state, then you literally add one particle to the system. So that's how we end up using A and A dagger. But it turns out that A and A dagger still does follow the same commutation relation. So mathematically, it turns out that this operator that literally creates a particle or removes the particle happens to have the same algebraic uh, formula for the uh, the, the the raising and lowering operating harmonic oscillator. So that's why you get the same factors of square root of n simply because it's based on the same math. So the physically, it doesn't make sense that they come out to be the same, but the mathematically, it, it depends only on this commutation relation that A and A dagger commutated is one. Once you accept that, then everything else followed as you saw on this slide. And that's how you end up with the same factors of square root of n whether you are dealing with harmonic oscillator and quantum mechanics, or you are dealing with the quantum field theory of the system of identical bosons and so on. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I do have a question, if I may. Okay. Uh, basically, just like a curiosity, you mm -hmm. said that using these operators, we can actually create new particles. Is that because, like, uh, in using the operator, like the, the rising operator, we are actually giving energy to the system and this energy is translated to a particle? That's that's definitely part of the, the answer, yeah. Okay. But there's okay. actually more. And you'll see that actually when you, when you really get to discuss quantum field theory, which comes very soon. So uh, uh, don't, there's not, not a long way. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Toshi. All right, so, so now that we introduced this creation addition operator, it is also useful so rewrite the Lagrangian using creation addition operators instead of X and X dot. And the reason why this is useful also becomes clear when we talk about quantum field theory. So here at this moment, it's just an exercise in harmonic oscillator, but this actually turns out to be useful. So one thing you learn in mechanics class, I hope, is the relationship between a Hamiltonian and Lagrangian given by this Lusandro transform, a P X dot uh, as a difference between the two. And I have shown this explicitly in the case of harmonic oscillator already last week. So once you have this form of H now written in terms of A and A dagger, 
then only thing I need to do is to replace P and X dot using A and A dagger here. And then I can write the Lagrangian as PX dot minus H. And here we go. P is basically A minus A dagger. X is basically A plus A dagger with dot on it now, the time derivative. And I have the Hamiltonian given by the form we have seen already. So I'm gonna just expand this out. Many factors cancel. And then in the end, you find very simple form, which is IH bar A dagger A dot coming from this and minus H bar omega A dagger A, that's this. And quite often for the purpose of talking about QFT later, we ignore the zero point energies. So I dropped one half. And also if you look closely, you have a term A, A dagger dot which is not a dagger a dot. But in the Lagrangian, total derivatives in time does not change Hamiltonian equation of motion energy. So you can actually forget about this. So what, what that means is that you can basically do integration by parts freely for the Lagrangian. So that's why a a dot dagger can be rewritten as a dagger a dot by integration by parts. So two combinations actually add up to this single term, IH bar A dagger A dot. And right now you don't, may not see much benefits in doing this rewriting. But as I said, when you get to QFT, this is a form you see much more often, especially for the non-relativistic quantum field theory. So this is just an exercise at this stage, but you will see this form a lot later on. Okay, any questions on this slide? Would you mind elaborating on uh, what do you mean by the total derivatives wouldn't change the energy? Yeah, so if you think about the uh, deriving the, uh, the, the, uh, or the energy you said. Yeah, so the, it, it turns out that it does change the zero point energy, but it doesn't affect the energy differences. For example, this zero point energy half H bar omega can be viewed as time derivative of half omega uh, H4 omega T. So it's a total derivative. So dropping half H4 omega changes the Lagrangian by total derivative, which amount to just adjust the zero point of your energy. So what that means is that energy differences are going from ground state to the excited states we talked about on previous slide, slide will not be affected at all. It just that, that moves the overall system up and down by a constant. So it does change energy that way, but it never changes something you can measure, namely how much energy would it cost you to bring the system from one state to another? That's something you can measure. You can never measure the ground state energy per se. And so in some sense, that's not a physical question to ask. And as long as you are talking about questions you can really measure, then this total derivative doesn't matter because it only changes the energies by a constant. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, good. So as I said, you probably don't see much benefit in writing Lagrangian in this form right now, but you would appreciate it later on. So now that we talked about single harmonic oscillator, we need to talk about the multiple harmonic oscillators. So if you have X for a position of single particle I, then I have this kinetic energy and its potential energy. If I have two particles, both of the harmonic oscillators, then I have X1 and X2 with their masses M1 and M2 and corresponding this uh, angular frequencies omega one and omega two for each of them. So that's how you can have the, uh, the Lagrangian for two harmonic oscillators. And if you have N harmonic oscillators, again, you just sum them up. And because Lagrangian is the sum of them all, a Newtonian is also just the sum of them all, them all. So for each particle, I have H bar omega, A dagger A plus one half. It's just that I have creation addition operator for each particle I and angular frequency omega for each particle I. And because different particles have nothing to do with each other, their creation and addition operators should commute. For example, if you have x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 
P1, P2, P3, dot, 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 then X4 and P6 would commute with each other because they are referring to different particles. And A and A dagger is a linear combination of X and P for that particle. If an X and P commute for the other particles, A and A dagger should also commute for the other particles. So A and A dagger commute when I and J refer to different particles. But if an I and J refer to the same particle, then I should have the same commutation relation as I had earlier. So A A dagger commutator then should be one. So end result is that A I A J dagger commutation relation is the Kronecker delta I J, namely that this is one when I and J are the same, but it's identically zero when I and J are different. So that's how you can have the multiple harmonic oscillators. So A and A dagger commute when I and J are different. And the building Hilbert space is the same idea as the case with only single harmonic oscillator, but the only difference is now you have a choice which creation operator you act on the states to go up in the ladder. So again, we start with the ground state. This state is annihilated by all of the annihilation operators AI, namely that if you act A1 on it, you get zero. A2 on it, you also get zero. Acting A3, that's also zero and so forth. So acting any of the lowering operators, you are supposed to get zero. That's the definition of the ground state zero ket. And starting from this zero ket, I keep acting creation operators on top of it. And each time you can choose whichever creation operator you like out of N you have here. And then you keep acting them on the ground state to build up the entire Hilbert space. So that's the case with multiple harmonic oscillators. And once again, if you write the Lagrangian using creation annihilation operators, each particle would have this form IH bar A dagger A dot minus H bar omega A dagger A. So I just put the same form for each I and add them up. And that's the total Lagrangian. So that's how you can deal with multiple harmonic oscillators too, using the same algebraic method. So it turns out that when we get to QFT, this A and A dagger uh, in some cases would correspond to an operator that creates a particle at the particular position I or removes the particle from that same position I. So that's how we actually start building the QFT uh, in probably uh, 10 minutes or so. All right, any questions about this? Yes. I have a question. Oh, go Sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so my question was, uh, since in quantum mechanics, two particles can be entangled with each other, and mm -hmm. since their energies must remain, the total energy must remain constant, would their annihilation and creation operation operator also still commute with each other, or would they not commute anymore? Um, so the different annihilation creation operators referring to different particles do commute. So that's just what the delta ij means. And so you're talking about entanglement, but when you actually have an entanglement, you have to talk about the, uh, the, the, the linear combination of different states, which can happen. For example, you can talk about entanglement between state with two particles i and j, or other particles k and l. You can take linear combinations of them. And once you take a linear combination, it stays that way. So states uh, actually remains entangled. And that does not have to do with the fact that a and a dagger don't commute. They still do commute for different particles, but you can still create entangled state. Am I answering your question? Yeah, that answers it. Thank okay, you. good. And oh, there was another question. Oh. Um, so we, so when we talk about uh, raising operators in ground states, saying that um, there can be raising operators for particle i, particle j, and particle k. Mm -hmm. So means that it commutes means that it is an independent um, response, which I raise a particle I has nothing to do with raising particle J. Mm -hmm. So it means that it is independent. But right. um, here's the question is that because now we, we just act on state zero, which mm -hmm. is the ground, does it mean that um, 
we are now assuming that the harmonic oscillators are of the same ground state or they are identical harmonic oscillators that are indistinguishable or neither, this neither of them. So this is in some sense, the product of the ground states for all harmonic oscillators. So definition of the state zero is that acting A1 that gives you zero, acting A2 that also gives you zero. So if you like the language of the tensor product of vector spaces, this is actually the tensor product of ground state for each harmonic oscillator. And if you want to write a wave function, this is also product of the ground state wave function in Gaussian for particle one, particle two, particle three. You take the product of psi naught, the ground state wave function I've written a couple of slides ago for every harmonic oscillator you have in your system. I see, I see, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I believe, um, yes, oh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, a little confusion about the Lagrangian. I haven't followed your um, the deduction closely, but uh, it seems to me that when you are um, inducing this Lagrangian, uh, could we roll back one slide? Yeah, and, and in a, yeah. Here, uh, I think the uh, last uh, the last second formula is the first part of that formula is symmetric to um, a and a dagger and a uh, a dot and a dagger dot. Mm -hmm. So the outcome of this formula should be symmetric too. But the a dagger a dot seems not symmetric to them all. So yeah. I just mm, I find it weird. You know that's completely true. So the, the reason why this ended up being not symmetric between A dagger and A is because I forced myself to do the integration by parts that dot acting on A dagger, I moved to dot acting on A with a minus sign. So I forced myself to act time derivative only on A, but not on A dagger. That's why this looks asymmetric. Oh, so but, you leave the, the other parts into the constant and to the derivatives. That's right, right. And you don't have to do okay. it, uh, and, but, oh, but this yes. is a sort of okay. a more uh, the compact form and, and it's, it's new, easy to deal with later on. So I'm actually anticipating what we're gonna do later. So at this stage, it, it looks arbitrary to you. Okay, and can, so, uh, I mean, can we change that term into A and A, product uh, a times a dagger dot. So that yeah, could you, be done, right? Yes, you, you can do that too. So if you insist on the symmetry between a and a dagger, you probably want to write this as half of a dagger a dot minus a dot dagger a. Okay, okay. Then looks symmetrical it. between a and a dagger. Okay, okay. I got it. Thank okay. you. But the difference is only a total derivative in time and that, that's mm -hmm. something we don't care. Uh, in for most problems. Yeah. Okay, thank that's you. an ex excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions about uh, the what we just talked about the harmonic oscillator? And I hope you have basically seen and everything we just talked about for the harmonic oscillator. But now we get to the question which you may not have seen, and that has to do with going to large n and thinking about classical limit and the uncertainty principle. So uncertainty principle tells you that delta x delta p has to be bigger than something, right? So that's how we learn uh, the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. You can never measure x and p with arbitrary precision at the same time. Uh, the product of uncertainties is always bigger than h over two. So now comes the, the question I'd like to pose to you. So here's the poll, Let, let's see if this actually works. So when you actually think about this uncertainty of delta x and delta p, suppose you go to very large ex high excited states in harmonic oscillator. So little n we talked about is, I don't know, maybe a, a billion or something. Then what happens to the uncertainty of the state? So you might say, well, the, the going to large n should, go, uh, correspond, should, should correspond to going to classical limit and therefore uncertainty should shrink. Another argument may be, well, if you go to large n, then x swings by a lot, p changes by a lot, 
So delta x times delta p should go up co correspondingly. So which one do you think is the case? So whether uncertainty would shrink for large n or uncertainty will be bigger for large n. And I already see you guys actually casting your polls. I wait just a, a couple more seconds. Now I have 22, 25, 27. Okay, I think that's about it. And so most of you said actually no. And I am I sharing my the results? I believe I'm doing it. Do you see that? Yes. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. So as you can see, four people said yes, 24 people said no, namely that most of you think that the delta x delta y actually get larger for large n. And it turns out that's the right answer. So to simplify the calculations, I take a unit where m, omega, h bar, all these constants are one. So a just turns into x plus ip over square root two. And then x is just a plus a dagger over square root two, because I add a dagger to this one, p cancels, I get x twice with one over square root two. So dividing by one over square root two, I just recover x. So expectation value for x vanishes, which sort of makes sense because n state corresponds to this uh, moving pendulum. So expectation value of x is at the origin as an average, so it vanishes. And you can do the same thing also for p. So velocity always goes from uh, going to the right direction, now stopping to the end, then going to the left direction, stop on the left end, going back and forth. So on overall expectation is that the momentum vanishes. So that makes sense too. Now, uh, to, to compute the uncertainty, delta x, delta x squared is given by the expectation value of x squared minus x expectation value squared. So I need to compute the expectation value of x squared operator. So I take the square of this operator, one of a square root two a plus a dagger, and I expand a plus a dagger out. And whenever uh, I have uh, a a, or a dagger a dagger in between, then a a changes the number of part of number n by two units, then state will be orthogonal to n on the bra. A dagger twice would change n to n plus two, that's also orthogonal to the bra n. So the only pieces I, I should keep is when I use one A and one A dagger, but in two possible orders. And then I use the commutation relation to be right A A dagger as A dagger A plus A dagger A commutator, that's one. So end result is this is the number operator plus one half. So that's the, uh, the expectation value of x, x squared operator. If you do the same thing also for the p squared operator, then going through the same argument, I find n plus one half. So the uncertainty of the state for this excited state n is delta x squared plus delta p squared that's given by x squared expectation value times p squared expectation value, namely n plus one half squared minus x expectation value squared and p expectation value squared. So that's zero. So in the end, this is n plus one half. And if you recover the unit, this is multiplied by h bar squared, which I set to one for the purpose of simplifying calculations. So the higher excited states actually are more uncertain than the ground state. So how do we understand this? So first of all, any questions about this algebra I'm doing? Is everything okay? I think the picture is much better than algebra. At least that's a way for me. So when you think of the classical motion for harmonic oscillator, and again, setting m and omega to one, then the Hamiltonian is just half p squared plus half x squared. So the constant energy lies on this circle on the xp plane. And the classical motion is such that x swings from origin to the right, swings back to the origin, then swings to the left, comes back to the origin. So x goes from one limit to origin to the other limit, back to the origin, and just keeps going back and forth 
uh, horizontally. But when X is the maximum, then the pendulum stops. So that's where P vanishes. And then the pendulum starts to going down towards the origin with the velocity pointing back to the origin. So that's negative. So as X decreases, the momentum becomes negative. So that's how you start to moving along this circle. And then the entire motion of pendulum is periodic. So just keep going in circles on this circle uh, many, many times. So that's the classical motion of the pendulum, right? So that's what harmonic oscillator does. And so the radius of this circle then corresponds to the energy. So again, in the limit where h bar and omega, I ignore all these constants, then half x plus p squared is basically the energy. And so this classical motion is then the analog of the number eigenstate because the energy is fixed. But of course, in quantum mechanics, everything is a little blurry. So what's going on in quantum mechanics is you basically put in the width of this circle because the energy comes in step of h for omega, which is one for this uh, slide. So anything between n and n plus one is considered to be the same state basically because the energy changes only by this quantized unit of one. So the quantum mechanical eigenstate of the Hamiltonian for harmonic oscillator, but basically corresponds to this band, this annual, uh, 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 um, this circular band on XP plane. And that actually explains why higher energy state are more uncertain. So clearly looking at this band, X expectation value is still zero because it's symmetric between left and right. P expectation value is also zero because it's symmetric between and above and below. And the ground state would correspond to this circular dot with the same width of H bar. But as you go to a higher and higher excited states, then the area of this circular band becomes bigger and bigger. And that's given by this uncertainty growing. So it turns out that this, uh, the number eigenstate or energy eigenstate actually doesn't resemble classical mechanics at all because it's all spread out for all values of X and P at the same time. So if you have good eyes so that you can even see the microscopic pendulum, then everything is blurred. The particle is at all X at the same time or P at the same time from one end and on the right to one end on, on the left. Everything is blurred. You don't see anything moving. And that's the meaning of the stationary state. Basically, there's no notion of motion going on here. And the stationary states are the energy eigenstates. So it's, 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 it's really, it makes sense that once you consider the energy eigenstate, there's no motion, everything's blurred, but the static. On the other hand, when you think of a classical motion, which I talked about on the leftmost diagram, I would like to see something going around in circle. But we also learned that minimum area on XP plane is the minimum uncertainty. So there is an area of H bar, that's the minimum you can get. So this minimum is achieved when you're in a ground state, X and P are a little blurred, but still small enough. And if you want to also consider the pendulum swinging back and forth, then what you would like to do, and the best you can do, is draw a circle of the area H bar, which as a whole would go around in circle. So if you can achieve such a state, then you can have a minimum uncertainty so that X is approximately at X naught, P is approximately a P naught within the size of H bar. And that's a state called the coherent state. Maybe some of you have seen this in quantum mechanics class, probably most of you haven't. So now I'd like to tell you what this coherent state actually is, which is a very strange notion. It turns out to be actually an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. And I, I tell you why that is the case, but I hope this picture makes sense. Why uncertainty is so much bigger for higher excited states if everything's supposed to be stationary, therefore everything's blurred over a big range of X and P for high, en high energy states. And that's why you have a much bigger uncertainty. So despite the fact that large N uh, in the corresponding principle, usually, usually people say should become classical mechanics in some way, 
the large end state of harmonic oscillator doesn't look like classical motion of pendulum at all. Instead, we like to look at a state which is not a Newtonian eigenstate, but it has this minimum area on X and P where this area as a whole would circle around on the, on the plane of X and P. So that's the state we should look for as a classical analog of the quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, any questions on, on this argument here? Everybody happy? I'm a little bit confused because then um, in the middle diagram, it's the number of eigenstate. Mm -hmm. And if you're saying the radius corresponds to the energy, shouldn't the radius not have any uncertainty? Well, so, so this is actually sort of a, a trying to impose the quantum uh, mechanics on a classical intuition. And so the, the uh, intuition from classical mechanics is that N can take any values because energy is arbitrary. But in quantum physics, we learn that N is not arbitrary. It comes in these integer steps. So the, going back to classical mechanics, what that means is that I'm dividing up this space of X and P in this red circle and next donut shape with the, uh, again, finite width, another donut shape with the finite width. And so I'm dividing up the plane into many the circular bands right next to each other. And that's, that's what corresponds to dividing up this phase space of X and P in the units of H bar. And you see these individual states coming in here. So that's their intuition. So the N used to be totally continuous, but now it's discrete. And I, I represent this discreteness in terms of this number of the circular bands right next to each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Any other questions here? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, uh, how is it directly realized that a coherent state has the minimum area of the... Well, so that's something I have to discuss on the next slide because I haven't shown you what coherent state actually is in terms of the harmonic oscillator Hilbert space. So then I can demonstrate that indeed that state has a minimum certainty. So let, let us get back to that. So now I'd like to tell you what coherent state actually is. And this is very strange. So this is actually an eigenstate of a, the annihilation operator A. And remember, annihilation operator is not an Hermitian operator because this Hermitian conjugate is the creation operator. We normally don't talk about eigenstates of non-Hermitian operators because they are not observables. But here I'm looking for this idea that X and P are approximately fixed on this XP plane and A is X plus IP. So talking about the eigenstate of an additional operator F with a complex eigenvalue F, because it's for non-Hermitian operators, eigenvalues don't have to be real because it's not observable. So complex eigenvalue F basically tells you what X is as a real part of F and what P is as the imaginary part of F. So by looking at the eigenstate of the annihilation operator, I'm basically specifying X and P at the same time. Of course, there's uncertainty. So you can never do that. So that's why we are talking about the size of the, the circle with the area of H bar in the end. But you see that talking about the eigenstate of A, roughly speaking, allows you to specify X and P at the same time that's why we, we can hope it corresponds to a circle like this on this uh, the, the, the classical orbit in you know, XP plane. So at least I hope it makes sense that at least it shouldn't sound too crazy that we are interested in eigenstate of an addition operator for that reason with a complex eigenvalue F. So if such a state exists, it seems to know both X and P at the same time. And indeed, if you do have such a state, then I can compute expectation value of X, which is one of screwed A plus A dagger, which is indeed the real part of F as, as suggested by this expression. If I compute expectation value of P, that also corresponds to imaginary part of F as suggested by this expression. So indeed, I have placed the particle at a position X at a certain velocity 
again, loosely defined because you can never be completely accurate on X and P at the same time. We all know that, but at least you manage to more or less specify both X and P uh, once you have such a state. And so F indeed is an eigenvalue that's given by the expectation value of the position and expectation value of the momentum in this linear combination. And once you actually think of this expression, and then the A is an eigenstate of uh, annihilation operator F. So roughly speaking, this commutation relation can be thought of A dagger being the relative respect to A or A being derivative with respect to A dagger. Once I change A by derivative with respect to A dagger, put that into commutation relation, you indeed find one. So it doesn't look crazy, even though this is sloppy, because I'm talking about the with respect to an operator instead of a number. This is a heuristic argument. But doing this identification, that allows me to think of a candidate, how this coherent state can be obtained. Something like this. Because if I think of A as a derivative respect to A dagger, and if I have a state given as an exponential of A dagger, the derivative respect to A dagger would pull out the exponent F to the front of the exponential. And so F as a number multiplies the whole thing. So acting A on this state gives you a number F. That's exactly what I was looking for. So in fact, uh, to be completely correct, this is the normalized expression for the coherent state, namely that I'm acting e to the f a dagger on the ground state. And of course, to have the proper definition of this e to the f a dagger, I do the theta series expansion. So that means e to the a f, dag f a dagger is one of n factorial f n to the n power to a dagger to n power. a dagger to n power acting on zero is state n up to the normalization factor of square root n factorial that cancels one over n factorial to the half power. So that's how I end up with this series of f to the n over square root of n factorial for the n state. You sum over all n's because it's a Taylor expansion. And there's an over normalization factor e to the minus f star f over two, which is just there for the purpose of properly normalized state. So it turns out that you can literally use this exponential of a dagger operator to obtain a state, which is an eigenstate of an addition operator. So if I act A on this state, that would change N to N minus one, but that will pull out factor of square root N, that will cancel N part of N factorial, you end up with N minus one factorial, and then this is f to n minus one times f. I can pull over factor of f outside of the sum. Then this sum remains the same, but I pulled out the factor of f to the front. Therefore, it turns out to be really the eigenstate of the annihilation operator. And you get to check this in the second homework assignment. So don't worry about this for now. You will see that yourself. But anyway, so that's how you know that you can really have such a state, which is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. Now that I have obtained a state, which is an eigenstate of an annihilation operator, next task is to really show that this state has the minimum uncertainty. But before getting there, uh, any questions about this slide? You probably have not seen this before, so I, I'm sure you got some questions. Um, how come? A is the derivative with respect to A dagger. Yeah, so this is a heuristic argument, but if I do this identification, A A dagger is A dagger derivative A dagger acting on something else. So if derivative acts on A dagger itself, I get one. If A dagger derivative acts on whatever on the right, that's still there, but that's canceled by this opposite ordering A dagger A, A dagger A, is a, a dagger derivative. So that's how the only thing that remains is one acting on whatever is on the right. So okay. this identification is consistent with this commutation relation. Excellent. Did you answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions?
So this must look weird. We are talking about linear combination of different energy eigenstates. But if you are looking for a state that moves, namely it's not stationary, then energy eigenstates would not do it because by definition, energy eigenstates are stationary. If you're looking for something that looks like classically moving particle, you cannot deal with that as an energy eigenstate. You have to take linear superposition of different energy eigenstates. So taking linear position actually does make sense. Now we would like to understand what this state actually does. And then moving on to the next slide. So we have already worked out expectation value of X. Now I need to work out expectation value of X squared. So I need to compute this one, but because F is an eigenstate of A, F bra is an eigenstate of A dagger acting on the left. This is actually a fairly simple things to compute. Then it turns out that this is the result. And comparing X squared expectation value and x expectation value squared, you can see by subtracting x expectation value squared, you cancel f squared, f star squared, two f star f. The only thing that remains is one. So delta x squared defined this way is a half, which looks small. And you do the same thing for p, and you again find delta p squared is a half. So taking square root of this, delta x is one over square root two, delta p is one over square root two, delta x delta p is one over two, recovering h bar, that's h over two. So indeed this state has minimum uncertainty. So that really does correspond to this tiny circle on xp plane because delta x delta p is whatever minimum it can be. So this coherent state is indeed minimum uncertainty state. So that's something we are looking for that would sort of correspond to a classical pendulum at a fixed position and fixed velocity. It does have minimum uncertainty because we are dealing with quantum mechanics. We are not sending h bar to zero. We are dealing with quantum mechanics. But nonetheless, this state roughly has specified position and specified momentum as far as it allows to within the uncertain principle. So this is the minimum uncertain state, which is now away from zero with the more or less fixed position and fixed velocity. So that should represent the classical pendulum that is swinging right now. And next thing, I, I'd like to see the time evolution of this state, because now I'd like to see that this state is indeed swinging. So that's how we would like to take the classical limit of the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. Okay, any questions on this slide? So the uncertainty of the coherent state, um, does this also increase as energy or the N increases? No, it doesn't. That's the whole point here, right? So delta X delta P is H over two, no matter what F is. And when F, which is X plus IP is bigger and bigger, you go farther and far away from the origin. So that corresponds to higher and higher energies. But even go to high energies, you still have the same uncertainty that doesn't depend on F or N. So yeah. it stays minimum uncertainty, no matter how far away you go from the origin. And so that's why this corresponds to the classical pendulum. Mm -hmm. X and P is pretty well specified, even though this is actually quantum harmonic oscillator. As far as quantum physics allows you, you can specify X and P within this degree, but I know it's so far away from the origin compared to size of X itself, uncertainty may look tiny or negligible. And that's the way classical pendulum should look like. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Um, I have one. So do we know if the coherent state is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian? No, it's not. So as I argued in the previous slide, whenever you're looking at the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, then it's by this definition of stationary state because the only change in the state is overall phase of e to the minus i e t of h bar. So there is no motion in that state. That's what it means to be stationary state. So whenever you talk about the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, nothing is moving. 
everything is blurred, but static. So N eigenstate, we talked about on a previous slide, on, on this intuition based on the classical phase space, is that it is all spread out around this circle. And you're looking at this blurred picture of the entire circle at the same time, and you don't see anything moving. But the idea is that when you actually study the time evolution of the coherent state we just discovered, it turns out that the X and P, which is more or less specified, really does move as a function of time along this circle. So at every moment, X and P are more or less specified and they do move along this circle with this minimum uncertainty uh, all, uh, all the time. So that's something you can sort of see as something really moving or swinging as a pendulum. And, and that's what we would like to demonstrate by studying the uh, time evolution of the, the coherent state. Next. Is, is it clear where we're heading to? Yeah, but so how do we know that the coherent state follows that path in the configuration space? Yeah, so that's something we haven't seen yet. So that's something we need to show on the next slide. Oh, okay, I see. Okay. So at least I have shown you the coherent state as X and P more or less specified with a minimum uncertainty so that it does correspond to the picture on the previous slide with a tiny circle on a big circle. But now we'd like to see how this tiny circle would move along this big circle. And that's the question that was just asked. So uh, let's actually try to do that. So this is still the minimum uncertainty. Now we come to this time evolution. So this is the state we just constructed. This is a coherent state as an eigenstate of the annotation operator. Now we like to look at the time evolution of the state. So namely that I act e to the minus iht of h bar as a time evolution operator. And of course, as you all know, when you're looting with an energy eigenstate, then this Hamiltonian would turn into energy eigenvalue. And this is the usual phase you get for stationary state. But now that we are dealing with a state that's not an energy eigenstate, it's a linear superposition of many different energy eigenstates. I need to keep the H as an operator at this stage and let H act on individual pieces of the state. And individual pieces has an energy eigenstate n plus one half times h bar omega. So for acting on each energy eigenstate, I have this eigenvalue. But overall, it's not an overall phase change. The state is changing the relative linear combination among the energy eigenstates. In, in some sense, this is an interference effect, which appears differently on different energy eigenstates. But surprisingly, this T dependence can be absorbed into F, which is a complex number, because this F comes with N power. This T dependence comes also with N in the exponent. So I can put together into a single complex number to the N power, now F to the E to the minus I omega T. There's a remaining T dependence that corresponds to zero point energy, which is an overall factor common to every state. So in some sense, it doesn't matter. I could have dropped the uh, zero point energy from the beginning of discussion on this slide. So this one really doesn't matter whenever you take absolute square of the whole thing. So ignoring this e to the minus i omega t, uh, t over two, the only change that has happened is change this eigenvalue complex number f to f times e to the minus i omega t. Namely the coherent state after time interval t would change to another coherent state. But now the eigenvalue has changed from f to f times e to the minus i omega t. And just imagine that initial f was purely real so that you have x and p vanishing. But after time interval t, now f changes from real number to some other complex number. But the only change of f is phase which means it doesn't change the norm of the complex number. So if you start with this real axis here, then it stays on the same circle as time goes on. So that's what I made a, a statement I made earlier. So if you start with a coherent state with this minimum uncertainty, this little circle of minimum uncertainty would stay on the big circle 
of equal energy. And if you look at the value of X and P instantaneously as its expectation value, then it changes as a cosine or sine of omega t because I take the real part of f e to the minus i omega t, assuming f is initial real, that's f cosine omega t as an value of x. Imaginary part would be f sine omega t for p. So now you see x and p changing as a cosine omega t and sine omega t that really corresponds to the motion along this big circle. So the point is that once you actually start with a coherent state, it stays coherent state, and its motion, how this circle moves, is really along this big circle. That's the same motion as what you would expect for a classical pendulum. So the classical pendulum is now made a little blurred by the minimum uncertainty, but follows the same motion as a classical pendulum would. And that's what indeed what coherent state does. And the reason I'm talking about this coherent state is when you go to QFT, you start to see a photon. I made a big advertisement about the last week. We will see photon. But once you go to language of photon, we still need to describe a classical electromagnetic wave. So if you want to have a photon, you need to satisfy still the, uh, the wave particle duality. So using photon as a particle, we need to find a way of describing classical electromagnetic wave. It turns out that classical electromagnetic wave is the coherent state of photons. And we'll come back and talk about this. So because talking about this class, uh, the wave particle duality is the big pitch I made about the need to study quantum field theory, we have to actually know how to actually describe this particle wave duality at the end of the day. We will describe particles using this creation relation operator. Okay, that's done. That's something we do in harmonic oscillator. But we needed yet another way of describing classical limit of that harmonic oscillator. And now this is the answer. It turns out that this coherent state is that will show up. When you're talking about laser with a laser pointer, it is actually a coherent state of bunch of photons. When you talk about Bose-Einstein condensate of the cold atoms, that is the coherent state of atoms. And we will also talk about coherent state of pairs of electrons that would actually end up describing superconductor where the, the, the resistivity of a metal would go to zero at low temperatures that also turns out to be a coherent state. So it turns out that this coherent state shows up in many different examples of highly quantum state of matter, which turns out to be the classical limit of harmonic oscillator. Again, this is kind of mind boggling because what you mean by classical, what you mean by quantum switches around depending on what description you use, but at least you can see that classical and quantum can coexist once you actually consider this coherent state. So that's the idea why we are talking about this. Now, I think it picture is, is better than a thousand words. So rather than talking about this slide, I'd like to demonstrate what that means in terms of a actually motion of these particles. So if I create a coherent state with fairly small f, which means that you are not that much away from the origin, your wave function is still kind of blurred because compared to the size of X or P, the size of uncertainty is quite large. And then time evolution of this state looks like this. So it does move like a pendulum, but because uncertainty is so large, everything is still kind of blurred. But if you go to coherent state with the eigenvalue 10, then it starts looking much sharper and the state really does look like classical pendulum, even though that's still a little blurred. If you go to very large f of 100, then you see this tiny blip. That's a spread of the wave function, and now goes back and forth all over big amplitude. Then this really does look like a classical pendulum now. So the coherent state does really describe the motion of classical pendulum this way. So as long as you go to large enough f, then minimum uncertainty we talked about becomes negligible and the motion of the coherent state really does resemble the motion of a classical pendulum. And I think the pictures are really worth thousand words. You see what I mean, that the coherent state is really a classical, uh, 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 behaves as if it were classical pendulum. Okay, any questions about this? I have two questions. 
Okay, go ahead. Um, um, just a few minutes ago, about classical and quantum can be put together. And um, there are semi-classical pictures uh, when we learned about um, quantum mechanics. And I personally, I don't know how to distinguish between um, quantum and classical picture and how do I know that is a semi-classical picture. This is yeah. the first. Okay, so <laughs> let me answer first question. So what I've been doing is I would say semi-classical. So I never turn H bar to zero in all of these arguments, right? I, I still use the same commutation relation, same equation identification operators. I never set h bar to zero. I can set h bar to one as a unit, but I never set h bar to zero. So everything is still completely quantum. But even though everything's completely quantum, when f is large enough, then it does look like it's a classical pendulum. But the size is still finite. There is still minimum uncertainty. Uncertainty principle is still satisfied. So it's semi-classical in the sense that this is still truly quantum mechanical, which ends up resembling classical. But this is still different from classical mechanics because there is still minimum uncertainty with finite h bar. Okay. Hmm. And what's the second question? I think that will be end of class today. The second question is um, since we know that um, the coherent state um, is an um, eigenstate of uh, annihilation operator, uh -huh. um, so the question will be. What is the what is the meaning of the eigenvalue of the coherent state? Yeah, so eigenvalue of the coherent state f has the meaning of x plus i p as on a previous slide, namely that you have specified both an x p and to some extent, uh, maybe I should go back to this slide. So you specified both x and p to some extent, given by the real part of f and imaginary part of f. So once you specify f you have specified both X and P within this minimum uncertainty. I see. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, and, I think, uh, oh, go ahead. I, I have a question re relevant to that. Um, yep. Let's say uh, just in this slide, the F should be a complex number, right? So mm -hmm. if we set the F to um, 100 I, then mm -hmm. what will happen to the pendulum? What, what will happen to your picture, uh, the, the animation? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, if, you, you if, you, if you state, uh, set initial f to be 100 times i, and that means yeah. you start with zero for the position, and p is at maximum. So that means that corresponds to the pendulum at the origin where it's moving fast to the, to the right, but it's at the origin as far as the position goes. So that's the initial state you specified. Then it keeps going mm -hmm. up the hill, would eventually stop. So that's when this pendulum swings now from purely imaginary eye, which is at the top of the circle, now to the, the rightmost part of this circle. That's where the position stops when you're on the, uh, the rightmost part of the pendulum. Then start swinging back with now maximum negative velocity and then swing all the way to the left and stop. So initial purely imaginary F will correspond to the pendulum at the origin in space, but moving at the maximum speed. So there is just a difference in the phase. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Because as I, yeah. I showed on the next slide, F changes only by the overall phase as the time evolution goes. Okay, so F uh, essentially, it, it looks like it's a kind of phase because with times I, we essentially, uh, it, we can comprehend it as uh, we move the phase for, uh, for what, for, for a pi. Right, that's right. So F is basically the complex plane coordinate. Instead of talking about X and P, I'm talking about F as X plus IP as a complex coordinate. And that complex oh, yeah. coordinate changes its phase as a function of time, which means that okay. it keeps going in circle. Oh yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Thank okay. you. Any yeah. other questions? I have Are a question. You? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I see several voices. Uh, go for the male voice. I don't know your name. Okay, I, I'm, I'm Alessandro. Um, Alessandro okay. I have a question. You said that like the coherent state in a way is a way to describe like classical phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, as we said uh, previously, it's not an eigenvalue of the, of the Hamiltonian. So mm -hmm. we cannot observe that because if we observe a system, which is like a superposition of many states, then the system decay into one eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. 
No, so not necessarily. Right? Depends on what you measure. If you measure energy, you're right. Uh, it it oh, collapses okay, okay, to okay, eigenstate okay. of Hamiltonian. But if you measure position, then it collapses the eigenstate of the position operator. So if I you see. look at the F equal 100 case, and if you measure, measure its position at some instant, then you end up finding the position fairly well specified, and you are bound to find the position within the width of this wave function. So I, I will never be able to measure the energy of the coherent state, right? Because if I do, then the system will decay. Yeah, it, it collapses to the energy eigenstate, but it collapses again to a fairly specified energy. So energy eigenstate, remember, is a circular band. And this circle is only as wide as a circular band. So it actually knows its energy pretty well, even though it's yeah. not the energy eigenstate. So energy is roughly speaking, just given by F star F times H for omega. Okay. So this coherent state knows X pretty well, P pretty well, energy pretty well. In addition, it knows its phase pretty well, and hence the minimum uncertainty. It has small uncertainty in every variable you look at, and that's why it resembles the classical limit. I see, thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. So, so I see that the coherent state has to move along a circular path in the configuration space because mm -hmm. uh, it, only the phase changes, but not the magnitude. Mm -hmm. So, but how do we know that this, this circular path is the same circular path that an energy eigenstate would take in the harmonic uh, pendulum? Yeah, so remember, I, I used the simplified no, no, no unit of m h bar omega to be one. Here I used two pi for some reason, but it doesn't matter. And, and in that unit, the Hamiltonian is just half x squared plus half b squared, right? So yeah. this circle is really the constant energy circle because x squared plus p squared is now given by the radius squared. So if the coherent state moves along this circle and that corresponds to the constant energy classically because it, x plus p squared is fixed. Have I any question? You can you say that last bit again? Sorry. Okay, so the Hamiltonian, when you said m h bar and omega to one, is just given by half p squared plus half x squared. Yeah. Which means half, parentheses, x squared plus p squared. And right. circle on xp plane means x squared, x squared plus p squared is radius squared. Right. So energy is now fixed as the half radius squared. Mm -hmm. So when this small circle moves around this big circle, because a big circle corresponds to the points with a fixed energy, then small circle maintains the same energy throughout. Energy is uncertain, as I keep emphasizing, because we never take h bar to zero, but within the uncertainty, energy doesn't change. Okay, I see. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Good. Anything more? Uh, I have a question about um, logistical stuff. Uh, did you ever release the poll for office hours? Uh, you know, I kept forgetting it. I always meant to do it in the evening. I keep forgetting it. So I, I just completely forgot. So I apologize. Uh, let, let me get back to work on that. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, any other questions? If not, let me stop the recording. And uh, Zoom seems.